Is it? Yep. Yeah, it's working. All right. Uh, yeah. Is that is it? Can you now hear the sound on YouTube? If I'm no, not yet, maybe it needs some some time before you can hear me. Right. All right. Can you hear me when I'm speaking? Uh, yeah. yeah. Is it? It's working. Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, all right. <laughs> Once again, let's yeah, try. It's working now. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the discreteness of time, and I think intuitively it makes sense what this means. Right. Grain of sense going down. Grain of of time. And we need to to understand what is a clock. What is a good clock? And to make a good clock, you need a stable periodic motion. And this has been the case. At since the very beginning of the scientific revolution in the 17th century, what Huygens is doing is making a good pendulum clock uh, which has a period of about one second. And this is a tool which is really important uh, for, for starting and for, for doing physics, for measuring trajectories and, and stuff. So the period, which is here one second, has become uh, smaller and smaller with time. At the beginning of the 20th century, we've reached periods which, which were 10 to the minus 4 seconds with the quartz clock. And nowadays, we are doing even much better. We are making clocks which are, uh, the period between two of the ticks is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And that's with uh, atomic clocks, uh, optical clocks with uh, strontium. So this is really, really good, really accurate. But they are physical phenomena for which uh, the characteristic time is even smaller than this. And to give you an example, uh, it's the top quark lifetime. The top quark lifetime has been measured. It's not prediction, it's a measure, this is a measurement. And it's 10 to the minus 25 seconds. How has it been measured? It has been measured with a particle accelerator at CERN. So, so the Say again? So by the length of a particle trajectory. Uh, well, not really. That's really by uh, accumulating statistics. And I mean, it, it, the process is, re is really complicated. It's not so, so direct. Like, you need to accumulate a lot of statistics about a lot of events by crushing out particles. You observe what you have as an output. And then you have a lot of theoretical uh, background behind, which enables you to interpret your result as uh, <coughs> a lifetime for the top quark, which is 10 to the minus 25 seconds. But this means that you don't need so accurate clocks to make measurements of physical quanti of, of physical phenomena whose characteristic time is even smaller. So that's possible. And, and for instance, you also have in cosmology. Uh, you have the theory of inflation, and inflation is dealing with characteristic time with, which are 10 to the minus 32 seconds. So we can. So the, the trick. What's the trick? Is that we can overcome the accuracy of our clocks by accumulating a lot of statistics. To obtain such a measurement, you need billions and billions of interactions between crashing out particles in the accelerators. So. Now the question is, can we reach Planck time? So Planck time is very small scale of time, 10 to the minus 44 seconds. And it is obtained by a clever combination of the fundamental constants. H bar for the Planck constant for quantum mechanics, G for gravity, and C for relativity. And um, this is thought as being like the smallest relevant physical scale for time. And we would like to know if it is possible or not to reach, to measure phenomena at this scale. That's basic question. And if we do this, this would mean that we would be able to probe some quantum gravity regime. Because this is typically a quantum gravity um, number, because you have h bar and you have g, quantum and gravity. Can we do that? And we know that's extremely hard. Extremely hard. And people have thought of doing this by using high energy physics, just particle accelerator, like for the 
quark lifetime. But if we want to do the, so, uh, we need a particle accelerator which would be out of the size of the, of the, the galaxy, maybe. So this does not seem to be at all reachable. <laughs> so we need to, to imagine other ways to do that. And uh, fortunately, recently, there have been proposals for low energy experiments that could maybe probe some quantum gravity uh, aspects of nature. And these are these experiments by Bose and collaborators and also Marito and Vedral. And that's gravity mediated entanglement. Lefterios, yeah? Well, it's quantum gravity because the short answer is because you have h bar and g. So you have quantum and gravity. That's the dimensional argument. Now, uh, you have other arguments, which is just, well, this is really small uh, scale for space time. And quantum gravity is precisely the theory which is going to tell you how space time behaves at a very small scale. Yeah. Like yeah. But space. Yeah, but space time is about the gravi gravitational field. When you are measuring a distance, when you are measuring time, what you are actually doing is measuring some aspect of the gravitational field. So this is it. Yeah. And so you have these experiments which propose to test the quantum nature of the gravitational field by creating entanglement through the mediation of the gravitational field. And then you have arguments saying if you can do so, that then it means that gravity is not a purely classical thing. It needs to be somehow quantum. And the trick behind this experiment, why it's possible, is because they are using this Planck number, which is the Planck mass, which is also somehow a quantum gravity thing because you have h bar, the Planck plan constant, and g. But the difference is that it's, it's not appearing as a, ratio, uh, as a product, h bar times g, but as a ratio. And if you want, because of this, you can get a number which is a number which is not too big nor too small. It's just a reasonable number. The Planck mass is a mesoscopic scale. 10 to the minus 8 kilograms, that's the mass of the grain of sand, typically. And so their results can be understood as, yeah, by, by the kind of this, this trick. They are uh, using this fact. I, I will not go back in the details of their proposals, uh, based, well, roughly speaking, they are just putting in superposition two masses, and then the two closest branch interact just gravitationally. And then when they, do recombi they recombine the branches and they observe entanglement. And this entanglement can only be uh, explained by the gravitational field in between. And they say, since we have created entanglement through the gravitational field, this means the gravitational field is somehow quantum. And it was um, noticed by Marios and Carlo that maybe this experiment could be precisely used to, to show something about the discreteness of time, to reach the Planck time scale. And with Marius and Andrea, we have tried to make this idea a bit more precise, a bit more sharp, by devising a precise experiment to see whether or not that's possible. And now I'm going to describe you in more details this experiment. What is the experimental setup? Very simple. It's very simple. Here you have it drawn on a space-time diagram. You have time. You have space, and you have two masses. One mass is classical mass. It's the source of the gravitational field, capital M. And you have another mass, which is quantum mass, which is like a test particle, which is going to be put in superposition of two branches, one on the left, one on the right. And uh, these two particles are going to interact through the gravitational field only. So the, the initial state at T0 for the quantum particle 
is this one. So you have the state which tells you the position of the particle. It's in the central channel, C. And you have the state for its spin. We put it in a superposition of up and down. And then we send this state through a Sterngala to get a correlation between position and spin. And so in the left channel, we will have spin up. And in the right channel, we will have spin down. And then, then we let it evolve. We let it evolve freely, but by the interaction with the gravitational field which is generated by this mass, the source mass, it's going to get a phase in each of the branches, in each branch. But in, it, in each branch, because the distance from the source is different, the phase that it's accumulated is also different. So you have a phase on the left, which is different from the phase on the right. And then we recombine the two branches, and that's time t3. And we are ending in a state for the spin, which uh, has accumulated a phase, delta phi here, which is basically the, the difference of phase between the right and the left. And it is very easy to compute the value of this uh, phase, delta phi, which has been accumulated. It's, it's this expression. So this relative phase depends on the parameters of my setup, like the masses, but also the, the time of free fall, the superposition, the distance and also the distance from the source, V. Yeah. And some fundamental constant like G and H bar. So next step, um, the, the goal, what we want to do is to, to measure this relative phase delta phi. So how do we do this? We project it by doing a measurement in a diagonal basis. And this is the probability to get the plus state. We want to, to get this probability, so we need to repeat this experiment several, many times to accumulate statistics so that we can compute the probability. And theory predicts that this probability should go as the sign of the relative phase. So this is this expression. All right. So now let's think about the meaning of this phase, this relative phase. You can write it this way. It's just the same expression as here, but a bit different. But now we have made appear this delta tau, which carries a relativistic interpretation. And this was noted in, the, in this paper. This delta tau corresponds to the difference of proper time between the two branches of the superposition. So let me explain. We know that in gravity, this is Einstein gravity, if you have a mass which is generating a gravitational field like the Earth, the time is not flowing at the same rate whether you are close to the center of the mass or far from the center of the mass. So in this example, the clock which is at low altitude has a time which is flowing slower than the clock which is at high altitude because of the gravitational field. And here, what is happening is just the same except that the source of gravitational field is the classical mass m. And so the time flowing in this branch goes slower compared to the time going in this branch. You may notice that the experimental setup is very similar uh, to the cow experiment, which has nothing to do with cows, just the initial of, of, of the uh, authors, Colela and the two others, I can't remember the name. And what they have done was the actual experiment of measuring this relative phase when the source was not such a small mass, but the Earth. And they have shown that it was possible to create a, um, a, 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 such a relative phase with um, the Earth generating a gravitational field. So this is really the diff delta tau is really the difference between the two proper times. And it can be very, very small. Now, let me introduce the hypothesis. So, before, before you go there. Yep. Um, so, in order to interpret the result through proper time difference, mm -hmm. wouldn't you require a clock? So, isn't this exactly the argument that um, Müller and Chu used to interpret their atom interferometry experiments as um, a from measurement of proper time of a um, uh, Compton frequency clock. 
I am um, I'm not aware of the uh, paper you're referring to, and so I'm not really understanding your question. Uh, you say we need a clock to say that this is a difference of proper time. Yeah. A clock which would be where? Exactly. <laughs> this is my well, question. So, where um, would it so be? I guess that So in this setup, uh, okay, this, this difference in this setup with the earth and two clocks, the fact that time is, is flowing slower here than here has been measured. It's, an, it's not only theory, this is an experimental fact. Yeah, and the way, clocks, yeah. yeah, with two clocks. Yeah, exactly. With two clocks, which are initially on earth, synchronized, and, and then uh, you put them at different altitude. So at this moment, they start flowing at different rate. And then you bring them together to compare them. You see that they are desynchronized. And this desynchronization can be measured. And you see it's, yeah. So I guess what I'm saying is that in order to um, uh, now, so what you do is you, re you rewrite the phase as a, um, uh, as a frequency times t. Right? So the phase difference is now, uh, you, you rewrite that as an omega times delta tau. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so the accumulated Yes. Um, which means that you interpret the omega in your phase expression as an actual physical clock, which is um, worrisome because uh, it's not a, a degree of freedom uh, like here, like really a um, really a, a thing that measures time, but it's just um, a frequency omega um, of your wave function. So I'm yeah. I, I'm uh -huh. I, I'm, I'm not sure that the interpretation of a, of a, of a difference of proper time it, uh, goes without additional assumptions about the nature of the frequency. Um, so, so here the frequency is, is the mass, there right? There's a realism assumption here. Yeah. There, there are realism assumptions. Yeah, there's a hidden realism assumption that the uh -huh. omega actually is a meaningful thing that fits. Yeah. Like yeah. Which I, I claim is hard to argue just for a um, regular uh -huh. wave packet. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm. I think the hidden assumption is a operation and it's not a clock, let's put it this way. Yes. But from where we come from, locally, from the point of view of the branch case, we are sure from the division of this area that the general of the relativity. Yeah, but you don't have a, again, now, um, operationally speaking, you don't have a clock to do that. So I guess the, the, the point is there was an argument that Magdalena and uh, Shastav made as a response to an argument of the type is that um, uh, what proper time would do in such a dual position, it would evolve, uh, if, if we would have now a clock in a dual position, then the proper time difference would evolve into the two clocks becoming distinguishable. So it's a degree of freedom of the system where the proper time difference becomes visible. And then um, you introduce distinguishability due to um, uh, uh, collecting proper time uh, difference. Okay? Because at some point, the two clock states will simply be orthogonal. Mm -hmm. And which means you lose coherence in the mm -hmm. system. But then you rephase after time time. And this loss of visibility is a direct consequence of the um, of the proper time difference. And this you don't have in this in, in this in this realization of the experiment. You don't have that. Mm -hmm. So you can have them propagate as long as you want. There will never be any sort of loss of coherence due to um, a loss of visibility in the interferometer due mm -hmm. to um, just additional evolution of the proper time difference. All right, I'm not sure to, to get all the details of this argument, and maybe I'm happy to try to understand it later afterwards. I think what we are, I mean, I would rather say that what we are saying with this interpretation is rather, rather basic and does not need some crazy assumption yeah. because the interpretation is very clear when we are having macroscopic clock mm -hmm. where we can see that indeed we are measuring a difference of proper time. And whether or not this is still valid when we have 
very small objects, this, yeah. I, I think what you're saying is fine, but if there is no stop, in what sense is I mean, it's, the real it's thing? No, the I mean, way they would understand it is that it's the real thing if there is an observable effect. So if you had two kinds mm -hmm. of clocks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this gone. That's yeah, right. Right. No, no, no. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So now let's go to. Uh, I think yeah. W what was there for now was quite standard. It was quantum mechanics with a bit of gravity. And now uh, let's introduce an hypothesis, almost out of the sky, and then we'll try to test this hypothesis. So this hypothesis is the following: We are assuming that time is flowing step by step. And that Planck time is the fundamental period. So we are going to make mathematically this assumption that this difference of proper time is not actually something continuous, which can take any real value, but it can only take a discrete number of values that is n times the Planck time. This is the assumption that we, we are saying. So this is the way we are implementing the idea that time as some granularity. And now we want to, to see whether or not it is possible to see experimentally such an hypothesis, to test it. So what this is going to change, it's going to change this blue box, and we are going to replace it by this orange box. What we are doing is just we are introducing a flow function, that is to say we are taking the the integer which is just below the value of t over beta. And uh, we are saying that the actual physics should, take, should have this formula and not this one. Of course, we can recover this formula in, in the classical limit from, from that one. Like when the steps are, are so many that you can ignore the discreteness and you can consider everything is continuum, you recover the standard physics. But you say, well, if, we are, if this is very small, I could be able to see the grain of, of time. And if I change this formula, I must also change the formula for the probability to get the plus state. And now it's changing. It's inside the sign. I have now this flow function. So let's look at the curves of these two probabilities. Let's make the assumption that the mass of the quantum mass is very small compared to the Planck mass. Uh, now, uh, the sign is just going to be a linear function. And so that's why I only have one straight line here. That's the probability as a function of t over beta. And so if with a standard uh, formula, I have just this linear function, but now if I'm proposing a modification according to the hypothesis, I have this step function. So at every integer numbers, it's getting one step higher. So experimentally, uh, what we would like to do is to draw such a curve to make a plot. This means that for each set of parameters, we need to uh, measure what is the probability p plus. So we need to uh, repeat the experiment many, many times for each set of parameters to get uh, the probability. So what we will get, for instance, is uh, experimentally is a curve like that, uh, a plot like that. So, but of course, here we, s we see the steps. So this would tend to say that our hypothesis is, is right. But it might be that we don't have enough accuracy in which case, this would be just the curve that we get. So now what we need to check is whether or not it is indeed possible to, uh, to see these steps. In theory, it, it is. But experimentally, is it really the case? So the task now is to try to find a range of parameters, which are circled in green here, which would be compatible with this set of constraints. So the first of constraint is the visibility of the vertical axis. We want to be uh, that these steps are visible. And this means that we need big accuracy on the probability. 
And to get big accuracy on the probability, you can always m make, uh, accumulate m m even more statistics, many, many runs of your experiment, and you will get a probability which is very, very uh, accurate. But of course, you don't have an infinite amount of time before you. You only have a finite time, and so there's the total time of the experiment that puts an upper bound, a lower bound on the accuracy that you can reach. That's the second constraint. Now another constraint is the visibility on the horizontal axis. And this means that you need enough accuracy on this set of parameters. Another imp very important constraint is uh, the gravitational noise. Because the experiment setup is like a gravimeter, a very sensitive gravimeter, which means that if there is a fly uh, or a bee which is flying nearby, it's going to change locally the gravitational field of the experiment. And so maybe it's going to blur the possibility to see the phase. And we should avoid this. We sh well, at least we should be able to know how isolated the experiment should be. And another um, important constraint is, of course, decoherence, because we are using a quantum particle, which is in the superposition of path. And so it should not decohere too fast, otherwise it will not have time to interact with the gravitational source. So all these constraints that I've just told you can be formalized mathematically as a set of inequalities. Some of them are, are here, not all of them. And these equalities, now, and then the game is just to, to solve this system of inequalities, trying to find a range of parameters which satisfy them, and a, a reasonable range of parameters. So I'm not going to show you the details of the computation. I don't think that would be very uh, interesting, but this is in the paper. And I will just s skip that and go directly to the range of parameters which we have found and which look to us the most reasonable one. And here it is. Um, <coughs> so in this table, you have all the parameters and then the value that uh, we have seen that maybe could, could work at least the most reasonable to, 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 uh, have all, to satisfy all the constraints that I've described you. I'm not going uh, th to go through all the list of parameters, but I'm just going to comment on some of them. First of all, there is this quantum mass, the mass which is put in superposition, and this should be 10 to the minus 10 kilograms. So it's two orders of magnitudes lower than the Planck mass. And that's already quite big, of course, for the experiments that we can do nowadays. And as a comparison, in the gravity-mediated entanglement experiments, they are requiring six orders of magnitude lower compared to the Planck mass. So, yeah, this <laughs> is requiring uh, a lot of progress in the possibility to put heavy masses in superposition, that's for sure. But I think what's interesting is that this is not completely crazy, or at least there is no physical principle that tells you that you, you will, we will not be able to do this at some point. Another par parameter that I would like to comment is the, this A. So this A quantifies the um, gravitational noise, how much isolated the experiment should be. And it should be isolated so that the limit of sensitivity should be that of a bee flying 200 meters away. So this is <laughs> very, very sensitive. But if you think of doing the experiment in, in space, for instance, maybe that's something indeed which is reasonable. You can probably have control with such uh, accuracy on the gravitational noise for your experiment. So and another parameter that I want to, to comment on, and maybe that's the, the weakest point, uh, but probably I know there are many experimenters in the room, and, and you would have to tell me that, but that's the pressure, because the pressure, so you need a very, very low pressure to avoid decoherence. Uh, that's the thing. And so we need a pressure of 10 to the minus 17 Pascal, and this is extremely small. And as a comparison, the interstellar medium is 10 to the minus 14 Pascal. 
So apparently, in labs, it has been possible to reach smaller um, pressure than 10 to the minus 14, but maybe 10 to the minus 15 was reached. And so there, there's still some order of magnitudes be, be, before we can reach that. So the bold conclusion of that is that we can probe Planck time regime. Maybe the more cautious conclusion would be to say that probing Planck time may not be so impossible as we used to think. Like we have an experimental setup with parameters which are almost reasonable and which could test this hypothesis that we have made about the granularity of time. So now, <laughs> I, th I think this conclusion to us, at least in, from people coming from the quantum gravity, uh, it's a uh, it's very surprising conclusion because people have thought of, of quantum about quantum gravity for years and uh, it has always been thought that quantum gravity was really too difficult to achieve um, it was impossible to probe it unless we have these high energy experiments so astronomical size uh, accelerators and so reaching such a conclusion is, is, is very weird and it took us some time to understand, to have an intuitive understanding for why this actually could be possible. And I would like to give you this intuitive understanding that, that we have. In this experimental setup, we are accumulating uh, a number of uh, advantages that we are using to reach Planck time. The first, we are using the fact that gravity is weak. We know that gravity is weak if we compare it to other interactions of nature, and sometimes this is presented as a very uh, as a bad bad chance. Like because gravity is weak, it's going to be very difficult to see anything about quantum gravity. But actually, in this experiment, it's a good thing that gravity is weak. It's a good thing because I can have macroscopic geometrical data like an apple. The apple is generating a gravitational field. And if I am one meter away from an apple, if I have two bees, two bees which are one centimeter apart, and I let them evolve during one second, then there will be a, a difference of proper time between the tra trajectories of the two bees. And because gravity is weak, the difference of proper time, which is going to be accumulated during one second, is just 10 to the minus 30 seconds. If the gravitational field was stronger, by this I, I mean that if the Newton constant was higher, it would mean that um, time, the difference of proper time, would change much, much faster, and so which would be much higher after one second. And so it's a good thing that G is small, because it enables the difference of proper time to evolve quite slowly, and. Uh, and I can reach 10 to the minus 30 seconds. Another argument is that the Planck mass is mesoscopic. And that's, that's the same argument uh, to understand the gravity-mediated entanglement experiments. Because in our setup, we are using a quantum mass which is close to the Planck mass. And, uh, and so the Planck mass precisely for the dimensional arguments that it involves both G and H bar, is bringing quantum in the gravitational realm. Third argument, we are using the magnifying power of interferences. When I was in high school, that was something that surprised me a lot. We were measuring, doing this experiment of measuring the width of a um, hair by making an interference pattern with a, a laser. And and by doing this interference, you, in a sense, you were able to magnify the size of the air and to see it on your screen as a big uh, blob that you could measure with the proper ruler. And then by some equation, you were able, from this size uh, on, on the screen, to determine what was the actual size of the air at the beginning. And so the interference here is happening because we have two branches which interfere. But these two branches, uh, they are actually quite big in time because they, they last for about one second. And so in one second, you have billions and billions of grain of time which is passing. 
But these billions and billions of grain of times are kind of annihilated when you are making the interference again. And what you are keeping in the relative phase is just the difference of amount of grain of time that you have between your two branches. And this difference of grain of sands, number of grain of sands, is very small. This is what we are seeing. So we are annihilating all the, the long path of time. Fourth argument, we are using again the leverage of effect of statistics. Like we need, for each data point on the curve, we need a lot, a lot of, of, of runs um, to overcome the accuracy of our clocks. And so this is similar to what they do in accelerators. Uh, finally, to, to conclude, I would like to give you, uh, to complete this intuitive understand, understanding, I would like to give you two historical examples where we also have used uh, mesoscopic particles at low energy to probe a microscopic scale. The first example is Einstein at the beginning of the last century. And what he has proposed was to deduce the size of atoms by looking at the motion of mesoscopic particles, which are grain of pollens moving, moving um, that you could see with a microscope. So in, it's a bit similar because you have to look at the motion of many gr grain of uh, pollens to be able to compute the, the mean free path. And then from that, from some theory behind, some theoretical model proposed by Einstein, you can deduce the size of atoms. And another experiment, which is maybe even more closer to what we, we are suggesting, is the experiment by Millikan. So the experiment of Millikan was, has proved two things. The first thing, it has proved that the electric charge is discrete. And the th second thing that Millikan has been able to do is to measure the value of the electron charge, the smallest. And he has been very accurate in his measurements. And the way he was doing this was also by observing the motion of mesoscopic particle. So he was using drops of oil, which were floating in the air. And these drops of oil in this machine, they were charged with one, two, or three electrons. And by applying some electric field, he was observing the motion of these drops of oil, which were mesoscopic. And then with some theory, has been able to, to see that uh, these motions were kind of discrete. And he was interpreting this as being, well, the charge behind this is discrete. So that's the conclusion, finally, of the talk. Uh, maybe two takeaway message. The first is that we have, we have proposed an experiment that could test an hypothesis about the possibility of about the possible granularity of time. And we have shown that this experiment is maybe not too far removed from current technological capabilities. Thanks for your attention. So are you, you're, you're sub suggesting, like you have in mind maybe an, another experimental setup which could be more efficient because we don't have this restriction on, all on, on decoherence?
All right. You, yeah. Uh -huh. So you're saying here in our experiment, we are um, using a gr the gravitational field generated by the source to impose this relative phase. And you're saying maybe this relative phase could be created, created by something else than the gravitational field, like uh, um, electromagnetic field. And we could see uh, as well the discreteness of the relative phase. This is what, what you're... Uh -huh. so I this is a typical confusion. I mean, this is getting me so wrong. So what you're talking about is some sort of atomic transition, but a central magnetic field. Yeah. Okay, what do you do for the remaining 75 watts of the quantum state? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a similar thing. Yeah. 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 No, the way, the reason it works here is that you, you take, take out and do two things. One is you place the air with a grain of sun. So what you do is that you put a much, much, much bigger concentration of sun. The second is that you take the neutron and you take them to Sparkman. So there you end up on a standard set of mean of the electricity line. These two are both um, conspiring to each other. <coughs> Amplify the Frank and difference in the phase. Um, so if what you try to do is measure the discreteness of the Yep. So, but even a higher sugar rate is going to be okay. uh, But yeah, if there is discreteness of sign in that C, it's just irrelevant. It's four quarters of magnitude of the mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Precisely, there, there could be indeed a discreteness in this parameter T, but the purpose of the interference is to uh, screen this discreteness to only keep the discreteness in the difference between the two passes. And, and this, is, this is it. Now, I think what's relevant in question is that, that indeed, you, you could, I think that you could replace the gravitational field by some other uh, field creating a difference of potential. And you could also create a relative uh, difference that you could also interpret uh, uh, as, a, as a time discreteness. But I think what, what matters, what's important is to have, uh, what, what's what I said, gravity is weak, and this is an advantage in our, it is a good point in our setup. If we are taking something else, we, we, we want that time, the time phase flows sufficiently slowly. And, and the tendency is of uh, potentials is that it makes it too fast. And if, it's, if the clock is running too fast, then you cannot see what, what you want. So gravity, I think, is important here in, in, in this set, setting. Yeah. So um, this, of course, would be harder to discuss, but just in two minutes, 
So you would like here like a free parameter, like alpha, that you could uh, tune to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we've we've been thinking about this, and I think it's fair remark that if we add a free parameter, then what we will see is, I mean, we will we will not target directly the Planck time, but uh, the Planck time times some scale. So we could have kind of an interpretation which is a bit wider maybe of, of the results. Yeah. Well, that, that's fair, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think you're right and I think that's the next step if we want to go further in this direction of developing the experiment. The purpose of, of the paper initially was just to show that it was not completely crazy, the idea of, of uh, approaching Planck time. And this conclusion can be reached without this parameter. Now, if we want to be more careful and tune uh, really at how, how close to the Planck scale uh, we can go, then indeed, yeah, we need this, this kind of, of uh, free parameter. So he's saying in each, what we are measuring actually is some difference between fluctuations uh, for coherent states. I don't think get it. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alejandro's critics was to say, yeah, that this the space time is is full of fluctuations at the quantum level, and so along this path, which is quite long, there are actually yeah, many fluctuations which are going to wash out. I mean, the idea that this time is really flowing step by step by grain of sand is very naive. Uh, it does not really, it is not described by, by any theory of quantum gravity. And so I can say a word maybe on this moti the motivation for why, why this hypothesis. Because it's true that ideally we would like to derive this hypothesis as a consequence of some model for quantum gravity, either strings or loop quantum gravity. And this is not the case. Quantum gravity or strings don't, don't say such thing. Loop quantum gravity says something about the discreteness of areas, not time. And it says that the spectrum, so in loop quantum gravity, the area is an, a quantum operator, and you can, can compute its spectrum, and the spectrum of the area is discrete. 
But again, um, even if we can make sense of a time, quantum time operator, and even if uh, the spectrum of this quantum time operator is uh, discrete, it does not mean uh, that this is the case, because this is not we are what we are measuring is not directly the, the spectrum of some operator. We are doing some, something else here. And so I think that, well, in quantum mechanics, there are different kinds of discreteness. There is this disc discreteness which is coming from the spectrum of some observables. And I think with the electrons, for instance, we have a, an example of discreteness which is coming from some, somewhere else. The fact that the charge, the electric charge, is not um, a continuous parameter but is, a, is discrete, is coming by sm small packets and this was proven by Millikan. This is a kind of discreteness which is of another, of another kind than the discreteness of the spectrum. And so I think that this hypothesis that we are making is a discreteness of this kind. It's, it's the same kind of, dis of a hypothesis that one physicist of the, 20th, of the 19th century could have made about the discreteness of the charge. It's this, it's this kind of discreteness. And, and, and so it can seem to be a bit wild. It's a kind of a wild hypothesis because it's not coming from a, a theory of gra quantum gravity that we would have. And that, that's true, that, that's fair. Um, but I, anyway, I think it's still relevant to look at that. Yeah. Okay, so Yeah, I mean, when I say that time is flowing step by step, I mean, this difference of proper time is flowing step by step. Uh, I'm yeah. not saying otherwise. What, yeah, this so hypothesis... The right side does not necessarily mean that no, 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 no. We could give other... I mean, this is like the, 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 the intuitive understanding that we then are trying to formalize in this uh, range box. But of course, we could give other meaning to, to time. We could, we could have said directly, no, I want that this time it's discretized and I could have said uh, because I want this time to be some kind of operator and yeah. yeah but then it's not uh, clear that this will be done. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, just to, uh, I think you have to explain something very similar. Uh, just let me say here the fluctuation due to the discreteness in one branch must be correlated, correlated yeah. in, in order to the, the other branch. Yeah. So the idea here in that case is like the standard way you, you could think that um, discreteness is manifested terms of fluctuation. And then you have independent fluctuation. So discreteness is, is it similar like having a coherent state um, and then fluctuations on top, the stop noise fluctuations in the coherent state. Yeah? So the discreteness is realized by fluctuations on top of some um, of some of some of some field. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, Because we have similar problems with quantum motion, it's very strange, right? I really don't know what else to make from that. That's one thing, if you could explain a bit further. And the other is, are you saying to start from the postulated argument that there's difference in this discreteness? Yes. And then see what the yes. Yes. Yeah. Now I'm saying that this is what you are saying without saying it. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, the, the, the difficulty we have is that we, we need to, we could, we could have taken, uh, you would like a smaller D. Yeah, but then you also have to consider, I mean, the A, you have to compare it both to the distance, but also to the value of this mass, uh, because you, you can be close, closer to the superposition with a mass which is smaller, and if you go farther, you, you need a mass which is bigger, and so somehow you, you have a, a balance to be found, okay. and, um, and this is the balance, like for this mass and this D, we could get this uh, constraint here. I you can have matter, but this matter should not be moving. Okay. Or you should control, or if it's moving, you should know how it's moving to take it into account and, uh, it, and to turn If No, it's not. If they are not moving, it's fine. If it's just because it all all the matter distribution, which is just around the experiment, is going to add some some phase to both branches. But if the matter around does not move, the phase is going to be always the same, and so you can subtract it somehow. Why? Uh, why? No, it's going to be de dependent, but I mean it's going to be the same for each run. It's going, to be diff it's going to introduce also a relative phase between the two branches, but as long as this relative phase is, is, is always the same for each run, it's not going to, to perturb the, the measurement of the probability. Well, well, if you are moving a chair in your office, it's going to change the gravitational field, so the difference of proper time, and so between two runs, 
it's going it's going to to blur like you you will have uh, you will not have the same amount of of grain of time mm. that's it <laughs> yeah thank you Welcome.